Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to begin. But before we start, I would like to invite Ms. Marnie Point, Program Coordinator, Native Indian Teacher Education Program at the University of British Columbia, to welcome us to the land. Asiam Nasiya, Ait Tanishkwalo and Kwatsi Kwatsnala. Ami Kwat Huilam, Ia Ti UBC, At Homathquim Ash Tamuch, I Hank Aminam Kan Homuch, Ant the Malni Iwist Point He, I Ait Mat Tamuch He. I just want to welcome you all to the unceded and traditional territory of the Musqueam people, the Hunkaminam speaking dialect here on the bluff. My name is Marnie Point. We have uh, dwelt in this area for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, I'm, my name is because we were the people that lived on the point, and this is where you sit today. So I just want to welcome you to this good work today. and. Um, it's a beautiful day, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We're truly honored. On behalf of the Faculty of Education, University of British Columbia, and the Anush Korchak Association of Canada, Welcome to the Dean's Distinguished Speaker Lecture. Among all our honored guests, I would like to greet our distinguished speaker, Marta Santos Pace, Dean Bly Frank, and Dr. Mary Ellen Turpella Font, and special thanks to two women who have traveled to Vancouver, especially for this event. Ms. Jennifer Charlesworth, representative of children and youth for the province of British Columbia, and Dr. Tatiana Cyrilina Spadi, professor at the Seattle Pacific University, who organized a wonderful conference this past August jointly with the Pacific University and Dr. Janusz Korczak Association of the United States. Welcome. Before we begin, and as a form of introduction, I would like to offer a short reflection on Dr. Korchak. Can you hear me? Because this seems to be going in this direction, and I'm going in this direction. <laughs> Hello? OK. Uh, on Dr. Janusz Korczak, as a man who listened to children, not only with his ears, but his whole being. These are the words that Korchak wrote in his ghetto diary. You can, quote, you cannot even understand a child until you achieve self-knowledge. You yourself are a child whom you must learn to know, rear, and above all, enlighten. How many of us know ourselves that way? Most of us barely look that deeply into our lives for answers, but judge ourselves and others by the sort of last event at the top and never asking the questions, never shoveling to the bottom of the problem. So we often arrive at erroneous conclusions and messages, sometimes harmful both to ourselves and to those we judge. Imagine the old doctor in the Warsaw Ghetto as he sits at night in a semi-dilapidated building on Jelna Street with his 200 orphans, hungry and tired, a glass of vodka, a piece of black bread, blackout shades drawn, and Korchak bending over his paper in the dim light of a kerosene lamp. He will begin writing, he says, by digging a well. And I quote, 
I shall try to do something different with the story of my life. Perhaps the idea is good, perhaps it will work, perhaps this is the right way. When you dig a well, you do not start at the deepest end. First you break up the upper layer, throw the earth aside, shovel full after shovel full, not knowing what is underneath, how many tangled roots, what other obstacles, how many stones forgotten and buried by yourself and others. Roll up your sleeves, a firm grip on the shovel. Let's go. This final work of mine, I must do alone. In his diary, Kolchak reveals his most profound self as he digs through his well of life from the present to the past, from adult to childhood, revealing that child's self still residing within him. He uses his self-examination as a blueprint for understanding children. Thus, to understand children, we need not apply only his pedagogy, but also the features of his character to ourselves. To learn what sort of person was Korchak, how can we aspire to becoming the kind of teacher and human being that he was? Unselfish, kind, responsive to another's needs, understanding and empathetic, empathic, considerate and so incredibly human in the way he beheld children, their lives, but also listening to what they said, watching their body language, paying attention to what they wrote in their diaries from their heart and their own truths, putting together the whole person, not just part. Allowing them to be who they were meant to be, and not what critical and sometimes bossy adults would want them to become. He understood the child from the bottom of the well of his feelings and thoughts, the child's circumstances from which he came, the suffering imposed upon him or her. And he wrote, it is the children who always had to carry the burden of history's atrocities. Last week, I read a headline in the Vancouver Sun. Ottawa, quote, Ottawa urged to extend child benefit program. The article goes on to say, children who are in families who have immigrated to Canada recently have various barriers related to race and language, and the poverty rates are higher, unquote. And those are very important factors. But the problems that are always bypassed go even deeper than race and language. That's too much like the top layer of Korchak's well. You've got to dig in, go deeper. Many of these children are children of war and have scars which only grow deeper if not attended to. When children suffer violence in childhood, it often reflects on how they cope as adults. Using myself as an example of a war child, I suffered persecution, physical and mental abuse, abandonment and loneliness. When I and other child survivors came here, nobody was interested or wanted to listen to our devastating experiences. So as an adult, I tried, I proceeded to live like my peers, whose childhoods in Canada seemed much more peaceful. I squelched within me the child that suffered. I married, raised children. And one day something triggered a memory from my violent past, and my world fell apart. It's all in my new book. The past can be unforgiven if not dealt with in childhood. Therefore, prevention is necessary in the careful upbringing of children, being mindful of their beginnings and helping them before they become embittered adults. If we could become more like Janusz Korczak, listen to children and adults alike the Korczak way, if we relearn to put our self-interest on the back burner and stop ignoring others, but listen to one another with compassion, we would become a fine model for the children 
and help to heal their wounds before it's too late. I will end by reading you a small excerpt from uh, a teacher's prayer written by Korczak, which I translated some years ago from Polish. Although gray and humble in your presence, Lord, I stand before you consumed with longing, whispering quietly. I state my wish in a voice of unfaltering will. My eyes fire a plea beyond the clouds. Standing tall, I ask, not for myself. Please, endow the children with goodwill. Offer them help in their efforts. Give their toil your blessing. Lead them along a path that is not the easiest, but most excellent. Thank you. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Lillian Borax Nemetz, board, uh, on board of the um, Janusz Korczak Education, um, Janusz Korczak Association of Canada, and I'm an author and um, a poet. <laughs> Now it's my pleasure to call on Dr. Anton Grunfeld, board member of the Anush Korczak Association of Canada, to speak on and present our annual scholarship. On behalf of the Anish Korczak Association of Canada, I am honored to present the Graduate Scholarship in Children's Rights and in Indigenous Education for the academic year of 2017-2018 to Ms. Anne Montague in recognition of her contributions towards improving and enhancing the well-being of children in the spirit of Dr. Janusz Korczak. Uh, Ms. Montague graduated cum laude from the University of Utah with not one, but two degrees. The first one in cultural anthropology and the second one in international studies. She is now in process of completing her master's at the Departmental of, Department of Educational Study at UBC, Faculty of Education. Her research looks at the intersection of early childhood education and environmental education. Her thesis explores how progressive educational models might shape environment, might shape the young children into agents of change for the natural environment and details work of an anthropologically oriented case study that she conducted at the Green School in Bali, Indonesia from January to June 2017. Okay. So. Ms. Montague. Yeah, yeah I think so. Ms. Montague will say a few words about her research. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here, and I recognize some faces, and they're all very um, distinguished. And I'm sure the rest of you that I don't know are all as well. So thank you for the scholarship. Um, it's an overarching belief in the field of early childhood education for sustainability that when and how children develop their understanding of the environment and their role in it defines how students care for nature for a lifetime and shines light into how educators can mobilize pro-environmental behavior now and into adulthood. Um, foundational to this scholarship is the UNCRC. Uh, Article 29 specifically emphasizes young children's agency and right to education for the environment in particular. 
Um, despite an increased response to the widespread call for research at this intersection, there's a particular need for research to be done in international and diverse contexts. Uh, last year, I traveled to Bali, Indonesia, not to surf, which most people think I did, <laughs> um, but to conduct an ethnographically oriented case study over the course of six months at the Green School um, with our earlier program with children ages three to six. Having gained global accolades over a relatively short period of time for exemplifying how sustainability can be intricately woven into the infrastructure, culture, and curriculum of the school, um, I thought it important to look at if and how the Green School enacts its mission to educate their youngest of children in global citizenship to become green leaders. Um, in the heart of a pristine jungle, in the middle of Bali, there were beautiful examples of children connecting with nature and their natural environment daily. Children would converse with flowers, show concern over wood chips being dead trees, and watch in amazement as pythons were extracted from the campus <laughs> playground. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, with time, I wondered what was there beyond these types of easily observable interactions with children and nature? What were we missing as researchers and practitioners and human beings if we only focused on the connection that we can easily see and therefore easily report? What about the greater context of place and the complexities and contradictions within that also shape young children's learning? After an extensive amount of time spent in the field, I was better, to able, I was better able to understand many streams of intertwined connection that existed between children and what the environment actually entails. The inseparable natural, cultural, political, historical, economic realities of the greater place in which we all inhabit or were inhabiting for a brief six months in Bali. Fostering these deeper feelings of interconnectedness to the earth and to each other, as the early years program tried to do, and tries to do, and succeeds to do in many ways, also requires commitment to deeper examination of the complexities of interconnectedness. And even with, or I should say especially with, the youngest of learners. I believe that how we go about understanding children within these complexities sets a tone for how they will understand, experience, and contribute to bettering their place at a deeper level now and into further development. Creating a future of green leaders means, enact, means embracing the complexities that we are, we are more and more intertwined with as our global population rises, as cross-cultural exchange increases, and international relations become more prevalent. My research generously supported by the Korchak Foundation scholarship, furthers the efforts being made in early childhood education for sustainability and those who have laid the foundation for child advocacy in many contexts, past and present. Complexity is not a vice, it is a virtue. And to educate the next generation of green leaders, educators and scholars must heed the impact of context, not just the content, content of education. Thank you. Congratulations for the work you do. And now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Mary Ellen Turpella Fond, Director, Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center, Law Professor, a large school of law. Thank you, Lillian. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Marnie Point for her welcome to the territory. Uh, it's a, such an honor to be able to work and learn and exchange and meet on this incredible territory. Um, I would like to congratulate our student recipient of the award. That was amazing. I'm just sitting digesting the description you had of your project for the future. So. Congratulations and good luck to you. Um, I'm the director of the uh, Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at, here at the University of British Columbia. 
And I wanted to spend a few minutes, um, as we welcome an incredibly special guest tonight, Marta, to talk about a little bit about why that centre is sort of newly created here at UBC and how it connects to the work that our guest will speak about. Um, and in particular, the significant legacy we have in Canada and in British Columbia of having had um, 150 years of residential schools where nearly 150,000 children, First Nations children, were taken from their families and placed into residential schools uh, in which incredible degree of violence was experienced and cultural separation, uh, disruption of family systems. In British Columbia we had 22 residential schools and we continue to grapple with the legacy of those schools and communities and, in, and the important lessons that we took from that experience as we continue to address those issues. In British Columbia, the last residential school closed in 1984, and in Canada, the last residential school closed in 1996. Uh, and as many of us in this room know, we're very um, encouraged in Canada of having had a rigorous Truth and Reconciliation Commission process that looked at addressing the legacy of that school. And in that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were 94 calls to action for Canada. And those calls to action were deeply influenced by the work of our guests tonight. And in particular, the first five calls to action were on addressing the legacy of residential schools for the current generation of children and youth, First Nations children and youth, especially those very much overrepresented in the child welfare system who experience abuse, maltreatment, but also separation from their families. Uh, the sixth call to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada was encouraging Canada to take steps to remove from the Criminal Code of Canada Section 43. And Section 43 and the campaign to have that provision abolished from the Criminal Code and removed is something which we've worked on together with the Korshak Foundation. And I'd like to recognize Jerry Nussbaum and his incredible commitment and work to that and to recognize our guest speaker for her amazing work on that subject. And although Canada is considered to be in the G7, we have yet to remove Section 43 from the Criminal Code. And Section 43 permits the defense of discipline to use corporal punishment and violence against children, it's so-called corrective discipline. It continues to be used as a, a criminal defense in Canada. And it will be really significant for us to continue to campaign for the removal of that provision and for Canada to adopt that call to action. And certainly our guest speaker tonight, who I know she looks incredibly youthful, but many years ago was involved in the drafting committee for drafting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which is so influential in terms of our thinking about children's rights, but also was very informative for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And Article 8 of the UN Declaration talks about taking measures to prevent the forceful removal of children from their communities and their families into another culture. And all of these issues about force and violence and disruption in the, right, the lives of children are so important for us to recognize in this place because we are still working very hard on these issues and we're far from there. But the framework which in we work is a framework of human rights. And it's a framework that Dr. Korjak and uh, his How to Love a Child book and in his work exemplified. So it's just a great honor for me to also rec um, welcome our speaker and I know she'll be formally introduced by the Dean, but just to say what a privilege it is to have you here and to really honor and recognize your work that we've taken up in Canada and we continue to push for it and we appreciate all the work that you have done also to hold Canada to account in your work to review the periodic reports of Canada under the UNCRC and the Committee on the Rights of the Child, finding that we do need more work. So it is a beautiful place that we gather in, but it's a place with a lot of unfinished business. But thank you for everything you do to make it possible for us to keep pushing for that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Trapel.
Our deepest thanks for your words and your work with this sensitive and important history. It's now my great honor to call on Dr. Bly Frank, Dean and Professor, Faculty of Education, University of British Columbia, in whose care our the Faculty of Education has reached number ninth in the world. And so, Dr. Frank, please come to introduce our honored speaker. So good evening, everyone. And uh, I, too, would like to recognize that we're on the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Hunkamenum-speaking Musqueam people. We say in our Faculty of Education that we feel incredibly privileged every day to be able to do our work on this land. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Marta Sandoz Payas. Uh, having spent last evening with Marta, I'm now going to refer to her in the formal introduction as Marta. Marta was appointed as Special Representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children on May 1st of 2009 and took up her position on September 1st of 2009. As a high-level global independent advocate Marta promotes the prevention and elimination of all forms of violence uh, against children in the justice setting, in the home, in the institutional care setting, in schools, in the workplace, and in the community. She acts as a bridge builder uh, between regions, across sectors and settings where violence against children may occur. Since her appointment, she has been strongly committed to mobilizing action. We say she's a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and political support to maintain momentum around this agenda and to achieve steady progress across the world. Marta has more than 30 years experience on human rights issues, engagement in the United Nations and intergovernmental processes. She's the author of a large number of publications on human rights and children's rights. Before her appointment in her present position on violence against children, Marta was the director of the UNICEF Research uh, Center. Some of you actually know Marta, apparently, from visiting with her in Florence. Uh, she held a position, that position, since 2001. She joined UNICEF in 1997 as Director of Evaluation, Policy and Planning. Previously, she was the Rapporteur of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and Vice Chair of the Coordinating Committee on Childhood Policies of the Council of Europe. She was a Special Advisor to the UN Study on the Violence Against Children and a Study on the Impact of Armed Conflict on Children. She was a member of the UN Drafting Group of the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child and its optimal protocols and participated in the development of other key international human rights standards. I'm just absolutely delighted that Marta took up our invitation to be here in the Faculty of Education at the Dean's Distinguished Lecture of 2018. Marta has not been in Vancouver previous to her visit, and we're hoping that she certainly will come back again and spend time with us. Please join me in a warm welcome to Marta. Thank you so, so much. Good afternoon to all friends who are here. Dr. Bly Frank, thank you so much for your very gracious introduction and for inviting me to come to this beautiful place of endless tradition and inspiration, but also a place of such a beauty that I think, having been here for 
48 hours that this is paradise on earth and you should feel very, very happy to be in this wonderful part of Canada. I want to thank for the opportunity of joining you all today and for the opportunity of remembering and feeling inspired over and over again by the vision and the legacy of Janusz Koszak. And of course, I'm very thankful to the association in Canada that keeps uh, the, the vision together with the Faculty of Education so present and the legacy so present of this wonderful, wonderful um, leader uh, of children's rights. And I wanted to start, in fact, by, by recalling that uh, Janusz Koszak, for me, is personally a, a very steady inspiration. And as you heard, I, I had the privilege of participating in the drafting of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Mm -hmm. And I feel so humble when we realize, as we heard from Lillian a moment ago, that what he shared is in fact what we try to capture so many years later in such a wonderful, important human rights treaty that is fundamentally in force in virtually all countries around the world with the exception of the United States. So it's so important to see that so many years before the vision of Janusz Korszak of always being together with children and understanding and guessing the, the silence of children and what they do not manage to articulate and what they want to articulate and contribute to was so fundamental in his life and is so fundamental in all our lives. One of the principles that I take for me that Janusz Koszek promoted is that no child should be left behind. And that's why, in fact, he abdicated from a comfortable life in Warsaw to accompany the orphans into a concentration camp, um, giving his life for the vision and for the legacy that he wanted to, to leave with the world and paying such a high price himself. Uh, but leaving no one behind and leaving no child behind is in fact today a major principle in the new global development agenda, the, what we call the 2030 sustainable development agenda. And it's also very important for the Convention on the Rights of the Child because, as you may guess, that's what we wanted to capture when we draft a beautiful treaty, is something that stays uh, and, and inspires states to do every time better. And leaving no child behind means, obviously, putting children first. And that's also what Janusz Korszak wanted to achieve. And putting children first, meaning very concrete things. First, when policies are shaped, when laws are enacted, when budgets are discussed, when resources are allocated, um, but also when we look at the key skills that professionals who work with and for children should have and we invest in enhancing their capacity, their knowledge, their understanding to be the best defenders of the rights of children, always guided by what is best for children. So this is the ethos of, of the convention, but as, as you may guess, a treaty is an important ideological reference, if you want, but it's also a very practical inspiration for action. And in fact, uh, in a way, the convention calls on all states to translate its principles, its ideals of putting children first in very concrete actions for all children, leaving no child behind, everywhere and at all times. Um, this is beautiful, but of course the world is not yet there. Um, uh, but I, I have to realize that as we look back almost 30 years after the convention entered into force, we need to acknowledge the many changes that have happened since it was adopted. You know, so many changes, for instance, in new treaties that have complemented the Convention on the Rights of the Child, including its optional protocols. You may know that the last, the third protocol, recognizes that children are so important as subject of rights that they are entitled to bring complaints before the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, complaints about violations of their own rights, which is of course very revolutionary, but it's happening and it's reaching very concrete results. Um, naturally, we, we have seen that the rights of the child at the beginning were perceived as something that uh, we talk about as a footnote, you know, but all of a sudden became very central in the public debate and also on the policy agenda of, of, of many countries, including 
just to use a very important example, by establishing independent child rights advocates or ombuds for children in more than 70 countries around the world, including, uh, as you know, in many provinces in, in Canada. So we have a lot uh, to acknowledge. Uh, but importantly, and of course, as you will guess, I would like to tell you a little bit about my work on violence against children. The Convention on the Rights of the Child recognizes the protection of children from violence as a very central concern. And in fact, it has many provisions that explicitly recognize that children need to be protected from torture, uh, from uh, death penalty, from sexual abuse, but also from more hidden forms of violence, including violent discipline within the home or within institutions that are designed to care and protect children. And as you may imagine, very often violence happens behind a curtain of silence in those very uh, uh, hidden places where children are growing up. Um, as you know, violence, we talk about it, we have a number of important evidence that we refer to, but in many societies around the world, it's still perceived as a social taboo. It is very difficult to bring it in the open. It is very difficult to expose it, to investigate it. And when it, we look at the statistical information in countries, it's very limited. And when we talk to child victims, it's very difficult for them to feel encouraged, empowered, and trusted enough, not judged, to share their stories, to seek help, and to be supported in the end. So this was the reason why uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child decided to call for a United Nations study on violence against children. And this wonderful effort in which many all countries around the world participated, and academia, and civil society, and children themselves, in fact provided for the first time an overall picture of the magnitude of the phenomenon we are talking and where it is taking place. As we heard the Dean introducing me, I mean, recognizing that it happens within the home and in schools and in institutions and detention centers and at large in the community, in the neighborhoods, in the streets and very often between countries also affecting children. And this study had a beautiful uh, principle, which is there is no violence that is justifiable, and all forms of violence can be prevented. And in fact, evidence is showing this. But as you may know, and particularly those of you who work in the university context, when we have a good piece of research, we run the risk that it is cherished by the experts, and then it's shelved by everyone else. And we were very much afraid that governments would not take it seriously enough to use the recommendations of the study into very concrete policy action. And for that reason, the United Nations decided to create the special position of special representative of the Secretary General that would allow to bring the different parts of the United Nations together in addressing this issue, and also to bring countries together to learn from each other to be mutually supportive and to keep listening to the child and to how children perceive the best ways of preventing and addressing the violence that uh, is very often affecting, uh, affecting their lives. So now we have, of course, many good results from this study, and I will come to back to it to illustrate it a moment ago. But we didn't end in this journey to prevent and address violence against children. In fact, in 2015, with the new Sustainable Development Agenda, finally we managed to recognize that countries who do not address violence against children will be lagging behind, will have higher levels of under five mortality, we'll have more children out of school, or dropping out of school, in fact. Uh, we will have more stress within the families, and it, it was very important to include a very clear goal in the Sustainable Development Agenda so that all countries around the world, developed countries, less developed countries, in process of development countries, would have to take it very seriously so that by the year 2030, all countries eliminate all forms of violence against children.
When we started proposing this to many states, we were told that's an ideal, you know, you're a joke. You're joking, I mean, this will never happen. But we tend to believe that by investing and by joining hands together, in fact, we can reach that goal. And there are many actions that can bring us closer to it. And I, I would like to tell you about four important dimensions in this regard and how we can translate into reality this ambition of eliminating all forms of violence against children. And the first thing I would like to, to say, the first dimension, is that there are many good reasons to feel encouraged, to, be, to feel uplifted, and to believe that we can reach this goal. And in fact, over the past several years, we have seen many commitments to prevent and address violence against children, uh, you know, from United Nations fora to regional discussions to national laws and policies. And in fact, we have more and more better evidence of the strategies that work to prevent violence. For instance, by supporting parents in their daily life and uh, in having maternal leave uh, or paternal, paternity leave so that parents are more available to support their kids, to stimulate them, um, and to prevent the use of violence. We see many good developments, for instance, at the regional level, and of course we very much believe that um, Canada can be a force uh, towards the same goal. But to give you examples from other parts of the world, in ASEAN, heads of in a summit, heads of state have agreed to, to put in place a regional plan with very concrete targets that they are promoting and, and implementing on a, on a systematic basis so that they can increasingly create the conditions for children to grow up without the risk of violence. And being very aware that perhaps things cannot work as quickly as they would like, they issued a few months ago a baseline study to identify all the measures that each and every member state of ASEAN has put in place, from laws to policies to training initiatives to campaigns uh, to raise awareness and to form and uh, to provide capacity to actors in, in society who, who can make a difference so that they cannot miss the opportunity. But within countries itself, we see a lot of good uh, pieces of, of, of news, you know, that I, I would be here forever in telling you all these good examples. But I'm just flying from Iceland, you know, a little country in, in Europe. Um, and I was meeting the government, and I was so impressed that just a couple of weeks ago, the government has managed to bring together all political parties in parliament to identify the protection of children from violence and any form of abuse and exploitation as a national priority, and making sure that whoever is in government is going to keep that priority at the highest level of its policy agenda. But not happy enough with this achievement, the government decided that we cannot continue to work in silos, you know. The ministry responsible for children and social affairs thinks about children quite frequently, the minister of education, also most of the time, but the others need to think the same way and we need to think together, not leaving any child behind and making sure that the convergence of our actions creates the best nurturing environment for children to grow up. And in fact, here it is, a very strong and formal declaration by the government to make sure that silos will not be a reality anymore and all departments in government are working together and monitoring how well they are working together. Now, Close to 100 countries have adopted a national agenda on violence against children. You may say, oh, a national agenda is probably, it's a kind of a paper, you know, policy paper that people will forget. But let me tell you, the number of factors that are helping us to make sure that the agenda achieves results is quite encouraging. For instance, we have seen that the agenda has been developed in a widely participatory process where professionals participate, religious leaders, young people, of course officials in the different uh, governmental departments, parliamentarians, and everybody has the sense that this is also my agenda and I want it to be implemented in the best way possible because I am really committed to making it work. And in fact, in most cases in these close to 100 countries, we have the agendas based on sound evidence, on very comprehensive surveys on children's exposure to violence, understanding who is most affected, what are the real 
factors that generate the risk for some groups of children because they live in a very poor family, because they live in a very deteriorated area or in an area affected by organized crime, just to give you a, a couple of examples. And we have also seen that countries progressively are overcoming this temptation to say, oh, protecting children from violence is a question of human rights, so we will debate it whenever the parliament debates human rights or the government considers actions to uh, you know, improve the situation of human rights in the country. But it has nothing to do with the social progress of our, of our nation. Now they are bringing them together in the same policy agenda. And in fact, showing that Violence and poverty eradication goes together hand in hand with violence prevention and protection of families and social protection measures in the country. You may know that half of, of the people who live in extreme poverty are children. And you may perhaps know that half of the world's children suffer every year some form of violence. So the connections are very natural. And if we don't bring them together, of course, it will be very difficult to prevent the impact of violence on the life of children and on society as a whole. And, you know, in a very materialistic world as the one we live in today, I always like to recall that the cost of violence against children every year is extremely high. According to some studies, it can amount to 7 trillion US dollars every year. That is 8% of global GDP. Now imagine for a second that we would prevent violence from occurring and we could use 7 trillion US dollars to invest in the best quality services to support families with children. What we could achieve as a, a global universe. Of course, that's what we want to be. There have been also many good news in terms of legislation. You may know that I'm a lawyer, so of course I would like to tell you about laws. They play such an important role. As we heard already, there are many countries around the world which have a legal prohibition on all forms of violence against children and do not accept that we can use violent forms of punishment or correction because we are the family or because we are... Uh, professionals working in a care or protection setting, or because we are teachers in the school. There are still 80 countries who do not forbid the use of corporal punishment in, in schools, for instance. So a lot to do, as you may imagine. But many countries are moving forward. And in fact, we have more than 50 countries, 58 countries, with an overall prohibition of the use of all forms of violence, whatever it may be online, offline, in the family, in the school, in the community, in institutions, in detention centers. And this is important because it gives those who are victims the opportunity to seek redress, you know, to challenge uh, the ill treatment, to tell their stories, to be entitled to services that can help them overcome the trauma that they may have uh, suffered. And like that, we break the vicious cycle of violence that very often becomes intergenerational, as we know. I like to believe that when we have a clear indication in the law, we convey to society a very explicit and clear message of what is acceptable and what is non-negotiable. And like that, we encourage families to do the right thing, and we encourage professionals to do the right thing, and we encourage the nation to react if there is something wrong affecting a child and not allowing the harm uh, to, be, to be pervasive, as very often is still, is still the case. But to me, perhaps the most important thing is that when legislation is clear, we convey to children who may be victims of violence the message that they matter. You know, they are important, they are entitled to a different treatment and to be perceived as citizens of today, as people with fundamental rights that need to be respected at each and every second of their lives so that they can grow and meet their dreams, you know, which is our dreams in the end, and that is, of course, so important. Now, amongst the 58 countries which have this comprehensive prohibition, Canada is not yet there, but I'm really hopeful that you will help us mobilize 
even more pressure and uh, you know adherence and allies to make it happen in the near future. I know that there is a, a debate in Senate to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code, and I'm so 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 convinced that this will happen in the near future. And as a result, that we will also inspire many other countries to f to follow the example of Canada. Well, I'm a lawyer, I believe in laws, and of course I believe legislation is very important, but as you may guess, it's not a magic wand. And it doesn't change society, it doesn't change attitudes, perceptions, behavior, and therefore it's so important to complement it with many other actions, including capacity building of professionals, for instance, sensitization and information campaigns in society, raising the issues to be part of the public debate on a regular basis. And I, I, I recognize that when we ask children, you know, even in countries where the law is perfect, uh, you know, why aren't you using it? Why aren't you complaining? They feel we don't understand what the law says. This is for lawyers and experts, and it's a code that we don't manage to overcome. It's a labyrinth for us. So I want to tell you a few examples of countries that are addressing this to change this reality. And uh, Brazil uh, is a very good example in this regard through a very wide cross-party effort, a new law has been adopted to emphasize the rights of child witnesses and victims and giving specific guidance to the families, the professionals, you know, from social workers to teachers to judges and lawyers, or what they can do if they have a hint that a form of violence has occurred, that the child has been a victim, and what they can do to refer the, the case to the right institution to help investigate and to prevent that the child is forced to tell the story over and over again, which as you know happens very often. And children ask, aren't you listening and aren't you trusting, you know, aren't you believing me? And th that circle can really be broken uh, with uh, pieces of legislation such as this and trying to make it sensitive to the child and putting the child at the centre. And in Chile, not only there was a very recent piece of legislation banning violence, but also the establishment on, of an ombuds for children who can be the spokesperson on a regular basis, who can be guided by the best interest of the child, and who has access to places where children are living. You know, it may be a care institution, or it can be a school, or it can be a detention centre, so that they can be the spokesperson for what children are suffering. And in Poland, and I, I know that we have many friends, of course, connected Poland with the Janusz Korczak, but I feel so encouraged by the work that the Ombuds has promoted there, because it has decided to do a survey on a regular basis to understand how the attitudes and perceptions in society have been changing as a result of the existing legislation. And increasingly, it has marked that there is more and more disapproval of the use of violent forms of discipline against children, and there is more and more pressure for quality services to be uh, in place and to be resourced enough to make a difference in the life of children. Now, these are very good news, as you may guess, and I'm just illustrating it very briefly. But the task that we have at hand is enormous, and we really need to move with a deep sense of urgency. And, and this is the second dimension that I, I would like to highlight to all of you. Every five minutes, somewhere in the world, there is a child dying as a result of violence. Every five minutes. And as I mentioned, half of the world's children one billion children every year suffer some form of violence, physical, psychological, sexual, online, whatever form, half of children in the world suffer these dramatic situations. And of course, if you picture the life of a very marginalized family with low income, very often joblessness, very limited livelihood opportunities, uh, with very limited access to quality services of health or education or social protection, the likelihood of violence marking the uh, domestic environment is obviously higher. And we see that this has greater impact on children who feel even more powerless and uh, less able to seek help and advice from others. I feel dramatically, uh, you know, disturbed by the number of 
places I visit around the world where children are used for political purposes. They are manipulated uh, dramatically. They are manipulated and instrumentalized by organized crime, by gang violence. And very often they try to flee that violence and they are perceived as being gang members themselves. So they, they do not m manage to be perceived as the victim and very often are identified as a perpetrator. So many kids are still sold today. It may be for adoption, it may be into prostitution networks or trafficking networks. Uh, they are sexually assaulted and abused, sometimes with the complicity of people they trust and they love, which is, of course, incredibly disturbing for them. And just recently, we have been studying what is happening, you know, to children with albinism or children who are accused of being witches in many parts of the world, and not only in the developing world, I have to say. And it's so dramatic to note the attacks, the cases of torture that they suffer, and how people are afraid of helping them because they feel that this may bring a curse to their families and to their lives. So again, the vicious cycle is very present. So many children suffer in different ways, but you know, to me, perhaps the most dramatic reality is that very often violence starts in early years. It starts very early in life. And a recent study by UNICEF, which is called A Familiar Face, has exposed the most recent data that is available around the world, very briefly. It is very common for families who have kids of less than one year of age to scream, to shout, to yell as a form of correcting or punishing the child. Uh, at least 300 million children between two and four years of age suffer on a regular basis psychological or physical aggression as a form of discipline. And in fact, for those who are below the age of five, more than 176 million children witness domestic violence on a regular basis. So for them, this is the scenario, you know, and they replicate it because they think this is the way you solve problems, and that's the model they are exposed to. So this is deeply, deeply, deeply distressing, but of course, when we address early childhood, the story doesn't end well for the child, for the family, and for society. As you know, through neuroscience, we understand more and more and better that stress, including exposure to violence, compromises the health and education and development of the child, but it has long-lasting impact on their lives. And in fact, it affects even the structure and the function of the brain. It compromises the acquisition of language by kids, and in fact, it affects the cognitive ability of kids. And they will not perform equally in school, and they will not develop equally like any other child. But in addition, they will be at higher risk of being involved in criminal activities later, or violent activities later in life, aggressing their members of their family, sometimes their spouses, when they become adults. So for us, uh, we are now investing very much in prevention of violence from early childhood, supporting families through positive parenting, early childhood initiatives, social protection initiatives, to make sure that the best opportunity for children is sought and they are supported in that endeavor because this has very high costs. In fact, if we do not invest enough in the life of a young child, adversity is the faith for their future. You may know that a poor start in life can lead to a loss of about a quarter of average adult income per year. And countries may forfeit as much as two times their expenditure in GDP for health and education together. So the cost in every nation is huge and we cannot ignore it, otherwise we will not overcome it. So violence starts very early in life, but unfortunately it accompanies the child as the child grows and very often it becomes a continuum. And I think school violence and peer violence are illustrating this in a very dramatic way. Of course, being in the faculty of education, I need to acknowledge that the school can be the best environment for us to learn how to prevent violence, how to be respectful of everyone, how to find peaceful solutions for conflicts and tensions. 
But unfortunately for many children around the world, the school is an ordeal, is not an opportunity. And you may face this on a, on a regular basis, but uh, playground fighting, verbal aggression and abuse, uh, humiliation, the use of corporal punishment by teachers or other personnel in the, in the school, sexual abuse. I can tell you that in some countries in West Africa, children tell us about a form of violence which is sex for grades because their teachers require sexual favors if the child young person, adolescent in particular, wants to progress in their education. Imagine how dramatic this is for their kids and the message that we are conveying. And in some countries, in, in Central America in particular, gang violence and organized crime just brings dramatic levels of homicides and child deaths that could have had a, such a wonderful present and future. So violence in schools and invasion of schools, uh, including with shootings, as, as we hear dramatic cases uh, not far from here, uh, is of course something that is very traumatic for kids and, and for all of us. I, we decided to address bullying and cyberbullying in our work recently, and we can, decided to listen to how children perceived it. And we did an online survey with more than 100,000 children in different parts of the world in all kinds of countries, all typologies of countries. And from these more than 100,000 kids, there were some findings that are really disturbing. Nine in every 10 kids considered that bullying and cyberbullying was a major concern in their lives, and two-thirds of the children had been victims of bullying or cyberbullying. Uh, to me, even more dramatic was the fact that one-third of those kids thought that it was so natural and people accepted it so commonly that they, didn't dare, they did not dare to tell anyone what they had gone through or to seek support from parents or teachers or a friend and they kept silence dramatically uh, inside. And of course, uh, just a cell phone rang, but all of you will have a cell phone and with cell phones, with iPads and uh, computer cyberbullying has become such an easy incident for kids and it's so easy to just post a compromising picture or a bad message or uh, calling a name to someone or excluding a young person from a chat network which can be so traumatic for them so cyberbullying is of course a dramatic uh, concern for young people and the fact that it can be anonymous and if you post something really nasty on the net, it can reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people and stay there forever. Of course, this is such a dramatic form of violence and it can lead to such dramatic consequences. So these are all forms, but of course I cannot uh, I absolutely need to also mention another form of violence. As you know, the world is being uh, f uh, confronted with the biggest wave of m refugees uh, since the Second World War. And so many of these kids are pressed to leave their homes and their communities because of violence. And when they leave, you know, they are running from violence, but they are running alongside violence. They are harassed on their journeys, they are trafficked very often, sometimes they are brought into transit centers that are support, supposed to be a protection heaven, safe heaven for them, but in the end they suffer abuse, they are excluded from any service, sometimes they are placed in overcrowded facilities, very often with people they don't know, very often with adults to whom they are not connected, that can be perpetrators of abuse and exploitation. And as we have seen in images in, over the recent past, they can simply be detained, placed in cages, as if they were absolutely unacceptable animals of a very big danger for society. And for these kids, just trying to digest the trauma they go through of having to leave their country, not talking the language of where they find themselves, hoping to be in a safe place, and being surrounded by these a traumatic and aggressive attitude, of course, how can they find the courage and the ability of 
telling the story and seeking the right help, you know. And most of the time we don't seem, as Lillian was saying, we don't seem to be ready to listen to their silence and their trauma and to overcome what they, help them overcome what they have been facing. And this is why in the United Nations we will be adopting very soon two global compacts on refugees and migration which have very important recommendations for states on children and I hope you will help us mobilize everyone to make it known and to be respected and for Canada to be a leader in this regard as it has shown in the recent past to be committed to, to becoming. Now, violence is pervasive, is corrosive, is silent. Uh, but it's not a fate. And this is the third thing I want to stress. We really can prevent it and we can make it part of a very distant past of all of us. If we join hands together, we can support kids in the first place to be the first line of prevention of violence. We can empower them to be uh, encouraged to speak up and to seek help. And we can help the services to be ready, to be resourced, to intervene early enough to support in the best way possible any child. We can achieve zero violence uh, against children. And I think the best way to do this is to listen to children themselves, as Janusz Korczak was doing, in fact. And, and when, we, when we talk to children, you know, what they say is, we want to build a, a world as big as our dreams. And when we ask, and what is your dream? Is a world of peace? a world of non-violence for us and for everybody else. And if you want to help us, help our families, help our communities, and we can achieve it together. They want to feel empowered. And they have high expectations of all of us. Of course, we are the adults and the leaders for them, right? And uh, I, I, I feel so you know, devastated by the stories they tell, but I feel so encouraged and humble by the resiliency that they convey and by the belief that they have that together we can make that change in the world as if it is just you know around the corner and it will be reality for for everyone and I feel so inspired by the action that they put in place you know raising concerns with their own peers talking to families to prevent child marriage for instance or to prevent kids from being placed far away in other families because they are hoping to have a better future and are subject to abuse including uh, sexual abuse creating blogs developing websites so that they can share information about where children should go and seek support and seek help, who can provide the best information, who can help them go through that journey of, from trauma to hope, you know, and they have such good advice to, to promote. And I, I always feel that this is very important, but I, I want to give a few examples. First, I told you a moment ago that the United Nations study on violence against children was conducted with the participation of young people, their recommendations, their consultations, their frustrations, their hopes, and that's why it was such a, an important and, and successful product, in my view. But when the sustainable development agenda was being developed, there were many consultations done with children. And you may think, oh, a few kids got together. No, no. More than 800,000 children participated in different parts of the world in national, regional, thematical consultations and online consultations. And you may say, coming from Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas, they would have very different points of view in relation to their priorities and what we should do to address them. Well, they had always at the top of their priorities, creating a world free from fear and from violence, systematically. And that's why I feel so happy that today we have the goal that they were aiming at as a formal goal in the Sustainable Development Agenda that all countries have committed to implement and to uphold by 2030 to have no form of violence uh, persisting in the world. And in fact, we have even very concrete indicators, you know, to measure progress in this regard. And of course, it's for all of us to monitor how well we are doing. And sometimes people say, oh, but if you talk to other kids about other issues such as migration and refugee situation, they will not have the same commitment. Mm -hmm. Well, they have exactly the same commitment. We did another online survey with more than 170,000 kids from all over the world who were not victims of uh, you know, any situation of becoming a refugee or being forced to migrate. 
and all of them recognize that migrating or searching safety in another place is a fundamental human right. Deportation should never happen, and violence is a constant risk that needs to be prevented and addressed as a priority by all countries. So no doubt they know the way, and it's for us to really take it very seriously. When we were doing this online survey, one child told us, and I'm going to quote, I have dreamt a lot, but nothing has so far been realized, so I'm tired of dreaming. And the problem is that it feels like we are hanging on a rope, and you don't know whether it will hold or it will break. And if it breaks, everything will be lost. I'm sure you will agree we cannot let the rope break, and we have the ability of preventing that from happening. So we need to redouble our efforts, and I think there are incredible opportunities in the near future. And this is the final point I wanted to highlight to all of you. I'm a very hopeful person, and I want you to believe like me, and I'm sure you do, and I'm sure you do. Now, next year is a very special year for all of us. We will commemorate 30 years of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and we want these happy anniversary to be celebrated in a non-symbolic manner, but in a real and tangible way, making a difference for children. But in addition, the General Assembly of the United Nations for the first time is going to meet at the highest level of heads of state and government to acknowledge the progress made in the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda, including how far countries have been able to go in ensuring best, the best possible laws and policies and data to prevent and address violence against children. So we can encourage each and every country to be there at the highest level, please help me do that, and each country to be the champion in feeling the pride of having the best policies, the best agendas, the best data, the best evidence, the best good practices to share, to multiply the effort and to go faster towards 2030 and creating a world free from fear and from violence for all children. I really believe we can do that. And by doing that, you know, we can gain a picture of, first, how far did we, were we able to, to move, but at the same time, how much more is required and how can we just join hands in investing in the best way possible to move faster and better. And of course, this will not happen by magic. We need, we need to make it happen together and change hap starts with each one of us, uh, as you know well. And to, to support this, we are very committed in, in my mandate to develop a global thematic report that captures these good processes and also the not so good processes that can be presented to heads of state and government to give them a kind of a roadmap that they can follow in the next years so that they can go, in fact, further and faster in our um, ambition of creating a world without violence and without fear for all children. I think this global thematic report, of course, should not be a bureaucratic piece, <laughs> but uh, can capture again the vision of Janusz Korczak, you know, that vision of the child at the center of our concerns, moving us forward, uh, because we want all children, of course, to be the happiest possible children. And I'm very hopeful that, together with all of you, we can achieve that change. And my final point is, you know, I, I believe that if we join hands together, the sum of all our forces will be zero, zero violence for all children, for each and every child. And if we do that, we can transform the number zero into humans kind, humankind's favorite number. I hope you will help me achieve just that. So thank you so much for your attention. your words and uh, I believe that you are the keeper of the flame <laughs> that was lit by Dr. Korczak. Perhaps you even are a female counterpart of Dr. Korczak. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much. And we thank you so much. And before you leave the stage, there are two things. 
Are there any questions? We don't have too much time, but we have time for a few questions. Anybody? Yep. Hello, oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a pediatrician by trade, so I see lots of kids and families. Um, halfway through your talk, I was, uh, my first question was, what's your definition of violence? <clears throat> but I, I got a few scenarios towards the end of your talk as to some of your thoughts on that. Um, I, I struggle on a day-to-day -day basis with kids that don't go to school, kids that harm themselves, kids that are harmed by drugs and alcohol um, before they're born. I'm not quite sure with those areas whether you consider, you know, how much of you, you know, where do you consider that on your spectrum of violence? Um, does it meet that definition? And uh, if so, um, we're just about to legalize marijuana here in, in Canada and how many mums are smoking marijuana and damaging their kids' brains before they're born. I struggle with, I struggle with that. And I don't know if you have any comments on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, let me say pediatricians are such important allies of our action. And I think they are such respected entities in the life of families and children. Uh, very often such a, a close interface with a child and such a good listener <laughs> of what the child may be able to formulate or may not be ready to share. And uh, that uh, instinct that you have uh, uniquely is, is so fundamental for us. Secondly, we work a lot with uh, the medical profession because we believe that overall it plays such an important role. And as you know, the World Health Organization, uh, as part of the United Nations system, has been working working a lot on violence prevention and has developed a very interesting uh, global action plan to empower and to provide the needed skills for the medical actors, uh, from pediatricians to many others, including, uh, of course, nurses and assistants in hospitals and so on, to have the right skills to understand uh, incipient signals of, of violence so that we can intervene early and can provide the, the right help. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that because it's such an important part of the work. And of course, as you may imagine, we need to work together to be able to do it. Coming to, to the definition, we try to use the def as, as a starting point a definition in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. As I was saying, it covers so many different uh, manifestations of violence from torture to sexual abuse and exploitation to sale of children to trafficking to violent discipline within the home and within institutions, uh, child maltreatment um, is, is another one. But it, of course the world evolves. Uh, the convention did not speak specifically about online abuse. And as we know today, it's such a big uh, concern for everyone, including for children. Um, and there are so many new forms that we didn't anticipate. Uh, let me give you an example. In s some societies, some extremely poor families feel that there is no risk for a, a child if a webcam films children in sexual acts or positions that someone else is accessing very far away and no one will ever risk coming in physical contact with the child. Not understanding that by exposing the image of the child, of course it is a form of abuse itself, but also that unfortunately um, the mafia <laughs> that takes advantage of these new technologies is also very well connected to find ways of identifying the village from where the child is coming or the family and supporting. So it is an evolving concept. Um, and I myself, you know, very often try to listen to children to understand how they define violence. And I, I, I'm learning a lot all the time, you know, so in a way it's a, a non-exhaustive list uh, that, cover, that is covered by the topic. But perhaps the thing that has affected me the most was, especially in Latin America, when these discussions were taking place and they were telling me, the worst form is structural violence. And they kept going back to this expression. And I kept asking, but can you explain what this is? And what they were conveying fundamentally is, was the sense that we do not belong, that we are excluded. We are excluded from the cultural activities in our school because our parents cannot afford to pay the fee 
or we are excluded from the ability of learning like everybody else because we don't manage to have the needed money to buy the books at school, or we are excluded from singing in the choir because we, we don't have shoes and we are looked as the people that do not matter in our context. So, you know, in a way, that sense of exclusion, of discrimination, of marginalization is so deeply rooted the way they see it that it may not be covered formally in a legal definition, but it absolutely needs to be part of the equation. So we try to be open uh, in that regard and try to acknowledge that in our evolving world there may be new forms that perhaps are not yet mm, exposed as clearly as others, but we need to be ready to prevent them wherever they will happen and whoever will be affected. I don't know if I am uh, completely, but at the same time just to say, if we want to gather data and analyze data as we are forced to do, including within the United Nations, of course we have very strict definitions in that regard and I, I can show you where, where, where to find them in terms of physical abuse, psychological abuse and sexual abuse in particular. Thank you so much. Thank Do we you. have time for one more question? Maybe, just one more. This one? Over there, yes? Thank you so much, Marta. It, it was wonderful as, as always. Uh, I live in Seattle, United States, and uh, I, I need to confess I watch NBC News practically always. Two days ago, they showed the episode which re really troubled me. It's about paddling the children, corporal punishment. Uh, you probably don't know, in the United States, 19 states still allow, legally, to use corporal punishment in schools. Now, in one of the schools, the school board decided that they need to bring it back, like, really. And they appealed to the parents. What puzzled me most and made me feel really angry is one-third of all parents said yes. They showed the paddle which they are going to use. It's quite dramatic. So uh, I'm thinking maybe we should start thinking about parents as a non-professional group which we should start educating. Absolutely. And uh, because violence when it comes at the agreement of parents, how can you prevent that? What do you think? Thank you, Tatiana. Just to say, of course, um, it's so important to work with parents and it's so important not to be perceived as finger pointing <laughs> and labeling parents as bad people because they want the best for their kids, as, as we know. But to understand the detrimental impact of using corporal punishment as a form of discipline or correction or punishment as within the school system, and, and as you mentioned and illustrated, is so important because very often people don't realize uh, w the way it humiliates the child, it creates a sense of shame, of exclusion, and in fact very often becomes replicated later in life. In some countries, in the law itself, the use of corporal punishment is perceived as a form of love. So how do we deconstruct that perception and create create allies amongst families rather than divide, you know, the, the spectrum in society to be perceived as the ones who come to uh, make families be perceived as the devil, which is absolutely not right. We, the, the family is the first important nurturing environment for the development of children. So working with parents is fundamental, in my view, starting in early childhood or before the birth of the child is the best and there again health professionals are fundamental in conveying the right message about how stimulation and affection from early moments uh, is so fundamental in preventing and creating the best environment for the development of the child. But there is still a long way to go, of course. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much. I think this is all we have time for, but I'd like to now call, and again, my deepest th our deepest thanks, uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Bly Frank, 
and Dean and oh well, I've done that already. Could you please come up with Mr. <laughs> Jerry Nussbaum, <clears throat> the president of the Janusz Korczak Association of Canada. I thought my voice would be strong enough without a mic. Uh, I'm quite humble to uh, present you with a uh, Janusz Korczak statuette, and let me uh, let me just read briefly the description who it's awarded to. So it's Marta Santos Paez, the special representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children, and it's awarded, uh, the statuette is awarded for working towards improving children's rights in the ways that encourage love for children, listening to children, fostering healthy children's lives, and building capacities in children in the spirit of Dr. Korczak. Uh, congratulations. and gentlemen, this concludes our program for this evening, almost. <laughs> and please join us for a small um, refreshments. I think it's over at the other side of the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs>